Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to see everybody back from your break, and uh, we'll go right into our fourth program this afternoon. For those of you joining us on television, I haven't done it all afternoon, not because I haven't thought about it, but I've just been so anxious to get into the book. But again, we want to thank all of you for your tremendous help in prayers and your financial help. I know most ministries complain that things dive in the summertime, but ours hasn't. And uh, it's just been holding right up there, and we just praise the Lord for every one of you, even if it's small. Oh, please. Please don't apologize for sending $5 because as I usually write back to someone like that that complain, I wish I could give more. I say, look, with God, little is much. And uh, we've proven it over and over. We don't beg for the $5, but my goodness, if that's what you want to give, why you just feel good about giving it. And we appreciate it. We uh, don't care how small it is or how humble the, the giver. We just thank the Lord for you. Okay, now we haven't done it for a long time, uh, except that today I'm uh, kind of uh, letting our new listeners realize that we've got this, what I think is as good a book as you can find on question and answers. 88 questions, and the answers come from previous television programs. And uh, it's been well received. We have sold, I don't know how many of them, We've never had anybody send one back or <laughs> gripe or complain about paying 11 bucks for it. So uh, thanks, Gary. So anyway, keep that in mind. And we are now on book 65, starting it today. This will be the first four programs in book 65. And uh, if you're interested in it, why call the office on our 800 number. And uh, you can just order whatever you want. We send everything out with an invoice. And uh, we've only gotten burned, really, about one time. Uh, as a rule, we get all our invoices paid. Okay, let's pick up where we left off uh, in our last uh, half hour. And we were in Colossians chapter 1. And I had come out of Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul had said, <clears throat> If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you. Now we're going to see that the Holy Spirit has prompted him to repeat it in Colossians. And that's why we came to chapter 1. All right, we left off at verse 19, where the Scripture makes it so plain that Christ is not the king of the church, he's the head. What a big difference. And I always tell people, if you are under a king, then you are merely a what? You're a subject. And... Uh, you're under the king's thumb. But we're not under that kind of a situation. Our head is that which is part and parcel of us. And uh, we are joint heirs with Christ. And it's a whole different connection with Christ than under the king and the kingship. Okay, now let's come back to Colossians 1 where we left off then and jump into verse 20. Colossians 1 verse 20. After being declared the head of the body, which is the church. Now verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, that is by Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether it be things in earth or things in heaven. In other words, that work of the cross was so complete that it satisfied everything that God had anything to do with. You and I as human beings, I don't think will ever, except when we get to glory, comprehend all that was accomplished at the cross of Calvary. It's just beyond our comprehension. We take what little bit we got by faith. All right, now then verse 21, and you, and remember he's writing to Gentiles as the apostle of the Gentile. And you that were at one time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath what? Reconciled. Now I make the statement, and I know a lot of people almost curl up and cringe. They, they are in such disagreement. But you see, when Christ finished the work of the cross, so far as the Godhead was concerned, 
how many of the sins of the world are now forgiven? All of them. Even the most wicked, unbelieving rebel, his sins are forgiven so far as God is concerned because the work of the cross completed it. And not only is he forgiven, he's also been what? Reconciled. It's all done. There is nothing standing in the way of the most rank, wicked unbeliever to have God's salvation if he will just believe it. Now, when I say believe it, I'm not just talking about a head knowledge and say, well, historically, yeah, I believe Christ died a Roman crucifixion. No, I'm talking about trusting that work of the cross as your salvation. That's what it takes. And it brought home to me so vividly several years ago where a gentleman called and he said, well, Les, he said, I believe that Jesus lived and died and was crucified and was risen from the dead. Well, he evidently left for work and his wife called as soon as he went out the door. And she said, Les, don't you believe it? He doesn't believe that Christ died for his sins. He may have a head knowledge of it, but he certainly knows nothing of it spiritually. It hasn't changed his life. Well, see, that's what I have to uh, emphasize. I'm not talking about just a head knowledge. Yeah, I believe that he died for me. No, no. This is something that we totally rest on. And that's why we have to be so careful that we don't add to it. Because, see, as soon as you're depending on your baptism, your church membership, or your denomination, hey, now you're back out in left field again. Because now you're not depending on the finished work of the cross. You're depending on something that you have something to do with. And God won't take it. It has to be a total reliance on what He has done. And that it's complete. Your sins are forgiven. Past, present, future. But it's not appropriated until you believe it. But it's done. All the sins of the world were paid for at that cross of Calvary. But lost people have to believe it to appropriate it. You know, I've given this illustration, I suppose, 100 times the last 15 years. If our Congress is going to appropriate, how many billion have they laid out there now again for highways? All those billions of dollars are put up there on a highway construction account for the states. But what does every state have to do? Make application. They have to appropriate it. And if they don't go through the paperwork of appropriating it, they're not going to get any of that money. Well, now that's a crude example. The work of the cross, the same way. It's there. And all we have to do to appropriate it is take it by faith. Believe it. But see, that's too simple for most people. They, they can't buy that. Well, I can't help that because that's what the Bible says. All right, now let's read on. Verse 21, you who are sometime or at one time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath, what? Reconciled as well as forgiven. All right, let's back up a page. Another verse comes to mind. I've got to use them when they come to mind. Otherwise, it's the Spirit moving for nothing. Back up to Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. And here again, I think these are verses that most church members don't even know is in the Bible. And it makes it so plain. And it fits when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 to the 12, Go not into the way of a Gentile, and into a place of a Samaritan, enter you not, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because he had come to fulfill covenant promises and the Gentiles had no part in those covenants. And these verses make it so plain. All right, here it is. Now Paul is writing to Gentiles there in western Turkey and he says, Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision, by those who are the circumcision, that is, by the Jew. Now here it comes. That at that time, while Gentiles were still out there and God was dealing with Israel on the covenant promises, that at that time you, Gentiles, were without Christ, 
aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. Now see how plain that is? Did Gentiles have any right to claim the Abrahamic covenant promises? No. Could a Gentile say, well, I can come in under the Mosaic law. I can be part of that covenant. No, you can't. That was for Israel. But now in this dispensation of grace, well, we're coming to that in the next verse, but let's come back to where Paul is telling it like it was for the Gentiles while God was dealing with Israel. All right, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And what? Without God in the world. Now, people don't like that. But that's the truth of the matter. Now, I've been reading ancient history again lately. I think most of you know by now I love history. I've been reading about Alexander the Great. Oh, the ungodliness, the wickedness. And every day he sacrificed untold number of animals to the pagan gods and goddesses. And then turns right around and cohorts with prostitutes. That's antiquity. And if they came to a village that he thought opposed him one least little bit, he just killed them all with no compunction. That was ancient history. That's the Gentiles that Paul is talking about. And they were all alike. The Babylonians, all you have to do is read Isaiah and you get a picture of what the Babylonians did to the Jew. The Medes and Persians were no different. The Greeks were no different. The Romans were no different. Absolute ungodliness at every turn. They had no morality. They had no human rights. Unless you were part of the elite, the wealthy, they did, but that was only a small percentage. I was just sharing with someone a few years ago, some of you were along with us. We had a cruise on the Mediterranean following in the footsteps of Paul, much like we're going to do in October, November this year. Yeah, you were along, weren't you, Sharon? And oh, some of the places. What was it? Wicked the society that Paul had to live in. Absolute gross immorality. And all the people in our, in our tour were about 80 of us, and we had a Bible study every night. And that one day especially, I just apologized for what they'd been exposed to. And they said, no, you don't have to apologize. It's just enlightening to know what the apostle had to put up with. That was everywhere he went. The gross, grossest immorality. So today is no different, and this is what he's talking about. The Gentiles were without hope and without God in this world, and they lived accordingly, see? Oh, but now verse 13, what's the first word? But, see, the flip side, and we'll come to it later when I get back to the but nows. I'm still got it on the board. I'm coming back to them. Don't worry. But here's one of them. But now. What does he mean by now? On this side of the cross, after the finished work. And so, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were at one time far off, you Gentiles, were made nigh, that is, to God, by what? The blood of the cross. Oh, what a difference it makes. But we'll come to that in a later lesson. Come back with me now again to Colossians. Chapter 1 again. Verse 22, how has he reconciled us out of the gross wickedness of a Gentile background? Why, in the body of his flesh, by going to the cross, through death. Now, there's another thought. Do you ever stop to think that in all of nature, all of nature, from various seasons of the year, to various other aspects of, of our natural environment, there is a constant reminder that out of death comes what? New life. Every spring when the trees start budding, they have come out of a dormancy that pictures death, and here comes new life. When the tulips start poking through the ground early in the spring, what is it? It's a picture of new life from that which has been dead. 
When the wheat farmer plants his wheat, the seed dies, and out of that dead seed comes what? New life. And so all of nature is preaching at the human race that out of death comes new life. Well, out of his death of the cross, the same way. Here comes new life by placing our faith in it. Okay, so verse 22 again, in the body of his flesh through death, through his work of the cross, to present you holy. Now that doesn't mean sinless. The word holy simply means set apart. You're different. You're not like the unbelieving world. All right, so we're set apart and uh, unblameable and unreprovable. Now listen, do you see what that says? Once we have placed our faith in that finished work of the cross, can God ever again point a judgmental finger at us? Never. Now, people don't like that. But that's the beauty of this salvation. Now, that's not license. That doesn't mean we can just go out and rob a bank or shoot somebody and say, well, I'm unblameable. No, no, no. No, no. That's not what it means. But it does mean that we have such freedom. We are so free from worry that if something should happen this afternoon and we'd suddenly be wiped off the face of the earth, we don't have to worry about where we're going. Regardless of what you may have done in the last hour or two or three, that's beside the point. We are unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Now that's a promise like most people can't believe. Now I'll give you another one. Hold your hand in Colossians, honey. We're going to come back in a minute, but come back with me to 1 Corinthians. Because I like to show that this isn't just one little quirk of Scripture. This is all part of the mosaic that all fits together. 1 Corinthians. And I'm the first to admit that the Corinthian church was the most, chapter 1, the first, the uh, Corinthian church was the most carnal of all of Paul's congregations. They had immorality in their midst. They had enmity between each other. They went to law against each other. Oh, they had all kinds of problems. But in spite of all that, they were believers. And so look what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So that you come behind in no gift. In other words, if you're a believer, there's nothing lacking. And we're to be waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, if he was telling the Corinthians, how much closer are we? We're 1,900 years closer. You know, I've always gone back to that old cartoon. I'll repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. The old boy is sitting in front of his cave, and he had a sign over the cave, the end is near. And then he must have had a second thought, and he added ER at the end of it. So every day the end is what? It's nearer. And now we're nearer than ever. Everything in the world is just screaming that it can't go much longer. We don't set dates. And with God, you know, time means nothing, but as things are shaping up, it would just seem that it can't be much longer. All right, so the Corinthians were already waiting, see, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 8. And people don't like this. I've had people get up and walk out of my class just when I read it. I hadn't even commented on it, and they got up and left. Because they were of the persuasion, you know, that you could be saved and lose it, saved and lose it. Well, after this one, they didn't come back, ever. But look what it says. Who? Jesus Christ shall also confirm you unto the end. Now, what does that word confirm me? It's got you locked in. He's not going to lose you. You're confirmed unto the end, and the end result is that you're going to be what again? Blameless. Isn't that fabulous? You know, years ago I told a lady who thought they'd had a lot of family problems because of sin in their background. I said, aren't you a believer? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. And then you think you still got sin that God is going to hold against you? Well, she said, don't we? 
No. No. They're forgiven. They're gone. God will never come back and accuse the believer. It's unblameable. I know this is tough stuff and a lot of people can't handle it. But listen, this is what the Word of God teaches. If you have been appropriated the, by faith, the finished work of the cross, then you are unblameable. You're in His care. You're in His keeping. All right, now reading on. You are unblameable and, and blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What day was Paul talking about? The rapture. The rapture. In the same way for us today. Maybe you, maybe you said some unkind words yesterday and you haven't really taken care of it between you and the Lord. It's still, it's still there. All right, what if the Lord should come? Is he going to point the finger at you and say, now wait a minute, you said something that day before I called you? No. It's done. It's all taken care of. Now again, that's not license. That doesn't give us room to do as we please. But as we go through life, we know we fail, and we know that we are to blame, yet God is never going to point the finger of blame at us when we get into His presence. All right, now verse 9. For God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what makes the difference. A true believer isn't going to go out there and, and live a life of sin. I just can't, I can't reconcile that. The true believer is going to be careful how we walk in our daily experience. All right, now I'm still not through with Colossians 1. We got six minutes left. Let's get back there. Colossians 1. Now verse 23. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled. Now that goes right back to what I said a lot ago. Not just a head knowledge, not just a historical fact, but you have trusted completely that work of the cross, plus nothing. Don't put your trust in a baptism. Don't put your trust in a membership someplace. Don't put your trust in something that pleases the flesh. You trust the work of the cross and nothing but. All right, if you've done that, then we will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature that's under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, those are words that I can't explain. How has every creature under heaven heard the gospel? But evidently they have. And there are other verses to back it up. Jesus himself was referred to as the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Don't ask me how, but that's what the book said. Paul comes right back and he says that when they come before the great white throne, they're going to stand there without excuse. And I can't explain that. That's what the book said. Paul writes in Titus chapter 2 that all they in Asia had turned against him, but they had Every man heard of the grace of God. Now, I, can't, I can't explain those things, but it's what the book says. All right, now here's another one. That every person under heaven has heard this gospel. Now verse 24, and this will take us to the end of the, of the half hour. Who? Now the modification is Paul. He's speaking of himself. Now remember, this is all Holy Spirit directed. Paul didn't sit and rack his brain on how he could word this. I think he just rolled it out and a secretary wrote it as fast as he could speak it. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. In other words, you all know how the apostle suffered his whole 25 years of ministry physically for the sake of the gospel. All right, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. How he was beaten and how he was shipwrecked in the ocean 
and how he was in prison and out, all for the sake of the gospel. See? All right? So, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh, and for whose sake? Your sake and mine. Members of the body of Christ, which is the church. See how he always associates the body, or how he associates the church with the body? All right, now then, here is the parallel with Ephesians 3, verse 2. Whereof I am made a minister, that is, to minister to the body of Christ. I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Now, we know that the law was given to Moses to be given to who? Israel. To this man was given this whole body of truth. Now, we'll start on that in our next program a month from now. This whole body of truth that is wrapped up in this one word, the dispensation of the grace of God. And in that dispensation of the grace of God are all these mysteries or secret things that had never been revealed before in Scripture or in all of human history until God speaks it through this one man. And that's why I come back. If other Scripture doesn't agree with Paul, then you take Paul. Yes, even if the words of the Lord Jesus don't agree Remember that what Paul says are the words of the Lord Jesus just as much as that what's back there in red. Because it's Holy Spirit directed and Christ is speaking through that apostle. So I'll come back to my analogy at the beginning of the program. If you make a will 10 years ago and you've made a new one now and you die tomorrow, they're not going to use the 10-year-old will. It's now defunct and they're going to use the new one. And so for doctrine, not for background, of course, we still use all of Scripture for background, for our learning, for our understanding. But when it comes to salvation doctrine, when it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to end time events, we have to go by what the Lord has revealed through the Apostle Paul. And all right, now I'll finish the verse. Verse 25 again, so it's that dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill, and you look it up in the Greek, that word means to complete the Word of God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.